All right, guys, welcome to uh, the last, the final fireside chat of 12 Petals for this year. Um, this one is going to be, a, 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 it's called Engaging the Audience, and we're going to be focusing tonight and or this day or this morning uh, on, on engaging the audience. And, and part of that means... Um, uh, engagement uh, during the performances, but mainly we're, we're, we want to dive into the um, the cultivation and building and maintenance of the community around the musician. Um, and so with us today are five lovely musicians, uh, all doing some really interesting stuff in, in the um, in the community building around around their work. So I'll go ahead and introduce you guys. Um, Mickey, Mickey Sawada. Uh, she's a pianist who's performed internationally at renowned venues, holds music degrees from top schools, but is currently best known for her Gather Here tour. Uh, here, as in here, listen with your ears, uh, in which she aims to travel to all 50 states with a piano. Uh, to perform in community gathering spaces, using classical music to connect us across the divisions in this country, this country being the U.S., uh, which is having a lot of divisions lately. Um, <laughs> so thank you for your service, Mickey. Um, she's com uh, currently completed a tour of Alaska and West Virginia. Uh, and this year, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you're finishing your projects in Massachusetts and Utah? Yeah, they're already done. I'm done for the year. Nice, nice. Okay, so you got four down. Um, yeah, we're really excited to have you and uh, thank you for being here. Uh, Chris, Christopher Whitley, Canadian violinist, educator and genre-defying composer. Uh, he's a founding member of Talia String Quartet. Uh, Chris, Chris has performed recitals across multiple continents, has spent over a decade developing innovative educational programming and has released original works on multiple international record labels. So he's doing quite a bit. Um, and is currently on a, uh, is working on his doctorate at, uh, through his, with his quartet. Um, lots of stuff going on and we have so much to learn from you. Uh, so thank you for bringing here, Chris. Uh, and last but not least, we got the Dead Trio. Did I pronounce that right? It's, it's always that Singaporean dad da, da trio. Uh, day, 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 yeah, sorry. Uh, day trio. Uh, made up of Chin Meng, Alexander, Jasper. Uh, day trio is a combination of unexpected combination of brass instruments, trombone, euphonium, and horn. Um, Day is also the word. Day is also the word for tea in Singapore, which, uh, which, uh, uh, coincidentally, the group is fond of having break time with. Um, they made their online debut in August 2020 when they began releasing music videos covering familiar tunes, while incorporating contemporary sounds and comedic on-screen acting. Um, and they're striving to be a premier group that represents Singapore's brass musicians internationally, and aiming to entertain via online video productions while conceptualizing live performances that break the barrier between musicians and audiences. So thank you guys for joining us. Um, yeah, where to begin here? Uh, I think, let me think, because I, I, I was gonna plan this, but I was like, no, let's swing it. Uh, I feel like, What, what I'm curious about in this moment is, um, and forgive me if this is this this wasn't obvious or if this was obvious for you guys, but like as I was doing research on you guys, the thing that started to to strike me was, um, the fact that a fan base for a musician or a group of musicians is not just a fan base, but it but done correctly it uh, a community forms around around the performer or the performers um and i was wondering 
and any of you guys can start this or take this, but I was wondering when that first, that concept that, that a community starts forming around you, uh, when, when for you guys did that start, did that like click as like, as like a conscious awareness, like, oh, this is, there's like something, there's like a, there's connections forming between the people that are listening to me. And, and this is potentially a, a, a self-sustaining thing, like a, a network. Um, I guess actually, Mickey, uh, I, I would like to start with you because you're, you're most sure. directly doing that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so I, the moment that everything clicked, I think, was when I re read this book called Musicking. I'll put it in the chat. Uh -huh. Musicking, um, like it's, it's just making up a word of, and reconceptualizing music as an action and a verb that people do and participate in rather, at, rather than a noun, okay. rather yeah. than an object. Yeah. So this book is arguing that um, music in it's like very, very basic form is like, mm -hmm. if you go back to cavemen making like drumming around a fire and that's how they felt connected to each other. And that's how they created bonds within tribes. And that's how they became stronger as a tribe and like survived when fighting other groups. Right. And so music has like really primitive power mm -hmm. and it's like something that's really uniquely human, right? That we're, we're moved in this very primal way by just these wavelengths in the air. Mm -hmm. And that's like such a musical, uh, not, a, not musical, such a, like a wonderful, amazing thing about being human. And this book is talking about how classical music has strayed so far from this like very primitive, um, like interactive origins. Mm -hmm. And so it's talking about like, why did classical music become so much more of like a museum piece rather than everyone who's in the room listening to music, they're not like actively participating, right? It's not like, you're going to rock concert and people are moving or like in mosh pits. Uh, it's so much more like an object to yeah. be admired from a distance. Yeah. And I really kind of hated that to be honest, as a classical musician, I felt like really uncomfortable. So yeah. then I was thinking about like, how, how do I bring back this, this thing about classical music, which is so special, but maybe we're missing the mark in how we're presenting it and how we're thinking about it. And maybe it has actually so much more power if it's just reconceptualized just a little bit. Um, okay. So yeah, reading that book was really influential to me. Wait, going a little bit deeper into that. What, so so how, how was the origin of classical music more, more interactive? Like what? what? Um, I guess it's talking more about music in general. Uh -huh. But I mean, even classical music, you go back to the era when if you could afford it, everyone had a piano in their house, right? And it was just the way that people entertain themselves or people socialize by, you know, having chamber music in their homes with their friends. It was just, um, it was just like naturally a thing that people came together around. Okay. Um, and then because like the concert traditions became so much more codified over the 19th century, you know, like we built, we started building really fancy halls and people had to dress a certain way and people had to clap at certain moments and it just became a lot more codified and it became kind of like a tool for middle-class or upper-class people to kind of prove their social status in a way, right? Mm -hmm. To go to these concerts or to be patrons to these musicians. Yeah. So then classical music just like kind of, started veering off from this original format as something that was like a lot more popular and a lot more for everyone uh -huh. and kind of became more elitist and got pulled in that direction All right. in the last 100, 150 years. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Okay, let's, let's cause I wanna come back to you cause there's a lot I wanna talk about, uh, there's a lot I want to go into about um, your experience with, uh, oh my gosh, where's my notes? Uh, Gather Here Tour. Um, 
because you you blogged about it so there's a lot of cool stuff that's that's that was in there that i'd like to go into but uh just to bounce back um do either of you or do any of the rest of you guys want to talk about um your first your your first experience with like really feeling uh, consciously aware that you were taking care of a community or building a community I can hop in. Uh, yeah, what Mickey was when Mickey was talking, it, it made me think so much about the spaces in which we perform, um, and and it's I know that's a big part of your project, Mickey, going around the, the country. Um, I it took me a really long time, I think, to have this realization, and, and there wasn't really like a light bulb moment. It was more kind of a gradual understanding of what I was doing particularly with the quartet because when you're in music school there's this whole set of um, priorities and goals that really looking back have very little to do with serving an audience i mean it's a lot about like instrumental ability or learning the repertoire getting like deeply into the tradition and i was like very obsessed with that so it took me a really long time to kind of get my head out of my butt and be like, oh, there are people here who are like supposed to be enjoying this thing that I'm doing. Um, and I think one of the most eye-opening kind of set of experiences was when the quartet first started, we were playing a lot of house concerts um, through this organization called Group Muse, which is now kind of everywhere. Um, and just watching people so up close interacting with the music that we were making was was really kind of life-changing in a way i mean one of the first ones we did was in this living room in berkeley and it was like packed full of people there were people like on bookshelves and there was a person like literally at my feet as i played and you can't help but feed off of that that energy um and it was also a situation where people clapped whenever they felt like it. They cheered whenever they enjoyed the music. They asked questions between movements. You know, all of these things were broken down and, and all of a sudden it became more of a conversation. And especially for the corset, I think that environment is something we've tried to replicate in every single concert since then. So even if we're playing in a big hall where we can't really see the audience over the edge of the stage, we still want to try to create that in environment because I think not only do we thrive in those situations, but I think it creates a, it creates an, an atmosphere and an opportunity for audience members to really engage in the music regardless of their experience level or their perceived experience level or sense of understanding. Um, yeah, so that was, that was kind of my experience. Very cool. Okay. Very cool. Um, any of the Tetria? Yeah, I guess I can. I can start them off. Uh, <laughs> um, so I think we we began our trio um, sort of midway through last year, and um, before that, like when the when the pandemic first started, it was. Um, it was sort of the first time we started working together again because we we were all separated um, geographically uh, for three years. Um, we all met in the same school like five years ago, and we were jamming uh, mostly trombone trios together because that kind of fit our range quite well. Um, but then when the pandemic started, we just we all came back to Singapore, but we still couldn't meet because of all the the, the restrictions. And, but we decided that we still needed to, to create music. And we started off with doing um, uh, acapella videos using the app acapella. And uh, that was cool for a while, uh, but we then decided that, okay, we have to take it to the next level. So we decided to um, do like more serious production, uh, separating the audio and the video uh, recording process and basically what we thought of was to because in Singapore um, many parents would yes send their kids for piano lessons and then if they learned another instrument it might be like the violin or the flute it's either there's two and we were thinking why don't people learn a brass instrument 
right? Even if they are like like nine or ten years old, they can already hold a trumpet or a horn, you know. So um, that is our long term goal, and we are still definitely um, a work in progress. But um, that is the aim of our trio: it's to to make brass music more accessible for everyone. And so I think the the first series of videos that we did, I think that uh, created uh, quite a bit of interest in our in our in Singapore. And then we got to do some live shows, and I think those were really cool as well. We did a Christmas show last year where it was uh, pretty interactive and our own brand of humor as well. So I think that that was a pretty nice experience. You guys have you guys have a very particular style too, where you. It, I feel like you you go very directly into audience engagement, right? Because because of the comedy aspect of it, you're you're feeding off, and 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 more than tr conventional classical music, you're you're inviting reactions, audible reactions. Um, yeah, because uh, you guys were talking about like like literally writing in skits into your into your sets um, yeah we, we do we do write skits actually for that christmas performance we were quite worried because uh we almost it, it was almost gonna be a recorded show <laughs> like it was not gonna be open to public so we we're afraid like if we made a joke or something there's not gonna be any laughter <laughs> And then maybe you could just digitally <laughs> edit the laughter in or something. <laughs> yeah. And laughter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and laughter. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, we, we do actually invite reaction from the audience. But to add on to Jasper's uh, thing about the, the videos, right? It was also uh, a concept where, you know, during COVID, when everyone is stuck at home, they re don't really have that much interaction or entertainment as compared to the past where they can just go out and watch concerts here and there but then we created something that can appeal to to them like non-musicians as well to, to the general public so that uh we could have that they have that relatability to 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 us brass musician which is something that they are absolutely strangers to you know yeah, that's, that's very uncommon in, in Singapore. That was also one of our point. But I think as a group, if I remember correctly, the first time ever we had an interaction with the audience was when we were still in school and we performed at the back of the stage. I mean, not the back of the stage, the back of the hall. Yeah, we played these... Uh, uh, audience? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the audience were like looking at the stage and they were waiting for us to walk on stage, but we appeared behind them instead. <laughs> I, mean, I, I forgot what we played. I think we played, we played some... some sort of fanfare. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the beginning of the concert. Yeah. Yeah. And then suddenly that all of them were just like, <gasps> and then probably after the piece, most of them got stiff neck or something. <laughs> Yeah, I would imagine that's not the most comfortable way to... Uh, I, I guess that was the most... Um, the first time we ever had an interaction with the audience as a as, as a group. that has a reaction like, oh, this is cool. Rather than, you, you know, because our school concerts are uh, sort of like, okay, all the students have to go and watch. And then most of the time people perform and all of them are just like uh, sleeping. Right. <laughs> but, but then suddenly when this something new came up, Oh, then was like, okay, yeah. Now we're talking, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Okay, cool. So I guess yeah, what I'm hearing here is, um, well, with the with Mickey, with your with 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 your exposure to the book Music King, it, it sounds like you you kind of had this aha moment of like music as a community experience versus a like this divided here's a thing on a stage and here's and and the audience listens to it um and then chris it sounds like you had a similar experience with the with with the performance you're talking about um 
and then actually the same thing with with you guys the day trio with like literally be, being in the audience and having some kind of and, and facilitating an experience that was a little different uh different enough to get get people's attention and bring them out of the banality uh or not not necessarily banality but like but introducing novelty in a way that brought them into presence which which can be a pretty it's it, which can be a memorable experience at least for me when i think of going to a classical concert or a show so because i'm not necessarily in that world like definitely something different or something that connects me to the humanity of of the the musicians would would bring me into the experience um so yeah speaking of the humanity part i mickey i'd like to come back to you um and i'm curious about i did a little reading but i'd, I'd love to hear your your take on kind of the the uh, the beginning of your project um and and like yeah where when the idea popped in as a, as a seed and then how it began mm -hmm. to grow. i'm very curious yeah so i'm japanese and i've lived in the united states for i don't know 18 years or something um and so in 2016 when donald trump was elected it was uh, of course a huge shock to me as i think it was to most people regardless of who they voted for and it was really a moment when we realized uh, the reality of this country that we may have been naive about before. And especially as an immigrant, I thought like, do I really wanna stay in this country, which is obviously going to be very hateful towards immigrants. And, um, and my answer was yes, like I wanted to stay and I wanted to contribute something meaningful um, during this time. And it just felt like, what is the point of playing classical music and spending so much of my time practicing when like the world is falling apart outside our door. Mm -hmm. And so I thought like, well, okay, I know music has this special power to connect people. And so what if I used music as a tool and like an excuse for me to travel really far and wide in the country, like all over every state to like the smallest possible town. I go to places where there are 200 people that live there. Um, places that you would never go to unless I don't know why you would ever go there and places where you may never like get to know the people that live there and so I thought you know if I can use music as a way to do that kind of traveling and like really get to know people really get to know places and like also document the process and share what I'm finding and creating with uh, connecting with people through music live in these places then that might be something worthwhile so that's when it started and i i yeah that's it's such a cool idea because that's that's something i've been thinking about even like even now like um even with the transition to to biden like it's everything I see on social media makes me feel like people are so divided and people have all these like- Oh yeah. I mean, I just went to Utah, right? Like super red place. I can tell you the next election is going to be a shit show. Sorry, excuse my language. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's going to be bad. Like there's just so yeah. much, so much frustration. Yeah. Over, it's, over on the, on the red side, it's not going to be pretty. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really like, yeah, it's really wild to me because I, With social media, it, it makes me, I'm just doubtful. Like I'm, I'm doubtful that, that we are as maybe like by ex expression and what, what seems, what, what registers as, as um, reason as, as the people on social media express it. As, as that comes out, like, what I'm doubtful about is, like, are we really that divide? Like, do we, is there, is this really what matters? And is this really, like, like, 
Because the energy behind a lot of the posts that I see makes it feel like, oh, like you don't want me to be here and you have no interest in connecting with me and no interest in being patient to have some kind of dialogue. But when I see people in, in person, even people who I feel like have different political orientations with me, um, typically the, the interaction tends to be respectful. And so there's kind of this disconnect between like what I see on social media and what it makes me feel like an in-person experience will be like. And then going into the in-person experience and finding that there's all these other ways that you can connect with another human being. And it's almost like the stuff that I see on social media is some kind of venting that that when you're in that reactive state of posting like that, maybe your priorities are different than when you're in person. And there's like this whole other, all these different ways that you can connect and, feed, and, and reconnect with the humanity and the person in front of you. Um, and that's something that I would like to, to go into with you a little bit because I can, because I was reading your blog and you write in your first entry, um, there's a line you said, who am I to go sauntering into a foreign place with its own culture and lifestyle and ask its people to give me their time and attention? Why should anyone care about classical music? And that's such like, it's such a valid fear and worry. And, and it, it was such a leap that you took to, be like well let's just let's just go see <laughs> let's just go see um and i think it's so important that you had that faith and um i'm curious um how soon after that what was it that you felt like you you made the right decision like uh um alaska was a really good place to start because um a lot of people respect that kind of like adventurous mindset yeah. A lot of people there are transplants from other states and they like made the decision to go to this like kind of I rugged see. place and be adventurous. And so they really respected that I like took the effort to do this. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think it really mattered that it was classical music. It was just something that I cared about that I wanted to give to people and they respect that. Mm -hmm. And that's how it is most of the time on tour because, you know, like I'm traveling by myself and it's, like people see me with like trying to move this piano <laughs> and like they have to help me right like I can't do it by myself <laughs> yeah. like from the moment I arrived they have to help me and they immediately just respect that I I took the time to do that and that it takes courage and like of course not everyone's going to come to my concert the reality is a lot of times very few people come to my concerts but like you're saying like people are really complicated and you can't just for, forget about an entire half of a nation because they have different beliefs from you and they're, some of them are posting terrible things or whatever, right? Like if you, if you kind of give up on it, then there's no way forward, I feel. Yeah. Um, and like, even if I've gone somewhere and I've only connected with say 20 people I still think that's something worthwhile and something that gives us hope. Like that's one thing I'm trying to do is like really give people hope to fight for something better. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I think, especially now it's really easy to just be in despair and be like, everything is terrible. Right. And yeah, everything is terrible. <laughs> but I think as artists, our, our job is also to show to express what is terrible, of course, like through music, you know, you can express so much that is uh, bad about the world, but also you can express hope and joy and beauty. beauty. And I think mm -hmm. it's, I think we should take that job really seriously. Yeah. Um, yeah, and <laughs> I only realized this on this tour, like last month after doing this for three years, <laughs> But it's not just that I get to know people who are different from me. These people are super different from me. They're getting to know one person yeah. who's like Japanese, is from Boston, yeah. probably has really different political beliefs, is a classical pianist. Like they've gotten to know someone who's really different from them. And like maybe, maybe when they hear on their news how terrible liberals are, maybe like they'll think of me and be like, oh, like, 
I connected with Nikki. She played beautiful music. She wasn't so terrible. <laughs> like maybe <laughs> there's a little bit of a bridge that I'm also, you know, hanging that way. Yeah, I feel like those, even even one relationship like that is is so important, especially if the connection was genuine. Like, I'm. Could I add on something to Nikki? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. It's actually um, so when when the Tay Trio was uh doing these online videos, it was during the period where everything was shut down in Singapore, like no live concerts or like if there were live concerts, it was like it was very few and far between. So we felt like it was very easy to just not do anything and just stay at home like everyone else, but um. I think the the performer and us really wanted to still try and get some some work out there, so we we started creating these videos because uh, we just wanted to get entertainment to people even in their even while they were stuck at home. So it's it's because like the scrolling culture of this day, right? You know, everyone's just on social media, and you won't stop at something until you find. You know, just one minute of entertainment. So we we started creating these one minute videos just to brighten up someone's day, you know, as opposed to like waiting for a live performance to happen. This was our way of just reaching out to people, even though it was not physical. But I think that was our way of maintaining the engagement there. Like we're still here. We're just you know we're adapting to the new the new style of performance. But hopefully we can still reach out to you. So a lot of our videos are, they're not the most like refined kind of like music video with like glamorous um, uh, effects and stuff, you know, like that would, that would be the equivalent of like how a classical performance is a museum piece, like what Mickey said. But we are just trying to look like a little bit like fools on screen. We're like, People, we want people to feel like we're their friends, you know, just from watching. So that's the kind of engagement that we were going for, like the, like, the human aspect of it, which is something that we also try to bring into our live performances. Like in Singapore, maybe a lot of times, like when there's a presenter or there's an MC, they will talk in very formal, as clean English as possible. And um, it's always a very formal occasion, you know, when you're watching a a classical concert but when people attend a day concert it's kind of like you know it's watching your your neighbor perform we want to give that vibe of like so we 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 MC and we present in singlish so it, it it makes it a little bit more fun and automatically the audiences even if they don't know us personally they feel like they do so that's that's how I feel like um, we try to break that barrier and keep the engagement there. Yeah. The other thing about the videos that we is like, since we were aiming to reach out to a lot of the non-musicians, the, the masses, the general public, we, we, what's the word? We detoured, not detoured, we deviated maybe into, um, different genres that maybe the three of us are not trained in. I mean, we're all classically trained, but we started doing pop, a little bit of, you know, um, EDM kind of music. Just things that, genres that much more people were listening to, but we changed the fact that it was brass instruments instead. So that was our own personal goal of like, you know, force feeding like, here is something you know, but not in the way that you're used to. Yeah. I feel like I feel like this the the thing the thing that's sticking out to me is both of you guys there was an intention to serve in 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 both of your endeavors like Mickey with with your bridging divides and and Alex you you said um, you just wanted to provide entertainment to people like there was and I feel like that's that's such an important an overlooked part of, of the musician. Um, at least for me, like, 
like growing up, I, I, I was trained in piano and violin. And for me, it was all about making mom and dad proud. Like there wasn't, there wasn't like, you know, like, like being the star child. It was, there, there's no, there's no consciousness around serving, serving an audience. Like who cares about the audience? Like it's just, do I get the right, do I get the notes right? And am I impressive? And um, yeah, just like the, that, that struck me so much of, of like how, an audience responds when you're coming from a place of intention um, and specifically to serve. Like, cause I can see like Mickey with your story of like you coming in and you trying to move a piano and like, like the, the vulnerability of it and the, 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 the visible investment that you're making into some kind of uh, endeavor. And, and like, I can see how even if I wasn't um, Asian, if I didn't like classical music, like just seeing you as a person, like trying to move this piano out of this band, like, like there would be no way that I feel I sorry for me. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I feel it's a very, like, there's so much just raw human connection of like, oh, this person is like trying to do something. It's That's trying really hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I can see how that that contextualizes your performance in a way that that would create like a very sincere connection. Um, yeah, that's yeah, that's just that's really cool. Um, Chris, I'm curious about about your take on this because you've you've gone, you've also explored a lot of genres. You've you've um, like with the Tay Trio being about expanding the accessibility of classical music and specifically brass. Like, I'm curious about your, your take on, on the violin, um, why you, you, you expanded into electronic music. Um, what, was, what was the reasoning for that? Like, was that also about accessibility or was there a different story behind that? A lot of that stuff is, is kind of more like personal passion projects and like not so much about accessibility. Um, because I, that's a it's a major priority um, in in the work I do with my quartet, um, and that's always been a kind of the number one thing on our mind. So hearing the Tatrio talk about the work, I mean, it's so much resonates with um, what we do um, in terms of repertoire. In terms of um, we we were doing our own, we were doing some digital content as well that was more kind of catered to for uh, educational activities. So we were doing videos for. Um, you know, fourth grade classes, introducing them to, to music, um, kind of taking them on these, on these wild little journeys. And, uh, and so I think there's, and I, I just agree with so much that everybody has, has said. Um, I think in some of my own personal projects, it's been harder to go that, to focus on accessibility, I think, but that's, but that's never been the, the goal. I think, I think expanding those genre barriers though is really essential because classical music, like Mickey was saying earlier, has, has kind of painted itself into a corner. Um, and there are also so many expectations that come with it that alienate people. Um, and again, I, music and art, it, it's never been about alienation. It's been about community building. And so um, changing people's perspective on what they think classical music can be is, is I think one of the most important things that we can do in order to kind of keep the music going and to be honest like keeping classical music alive for me has never really been a priority like i'm i'm kind of more of the view that if it doesn't serve a purpose anymore then it doesn't need to exist and 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 i i love the tradition i love the music and i'm a huge fan of you know beethoven and i love playing that stuff but i think again if it's if it's not bringing joy to people in a real authentic way then there maybe isn't there isn't a a need for it um I, I probably will like regret saying that, <laughs> but, but, but I, but I do, I do feel that unless we're questioning what this music is, um, then, then we shouldn't be dealing with it. I, and that's what I love about it, chamber music in particular, because I think the power of chamber music is that it's a model for collaboration and it is a model for community building in whatever format you, you perform it in. So I'm more concerned with what a string quartet, for example, or a brass trio demonstrates to our audience 
um, the, in, in bridging those divides like Mickey is talking about. I mean, you get three or four people into a room playing together. There are four individuals that even if we all voted or wanted to vote for the same person, there's four very different human beings. And I think right now, what's a more powerful kind of demonstration of, of coming together and bridging those divides than, than chamber music. And I think because of that, it doesn't matter if we're playing, you know, Beethoven or Lady Gaga or whatever, it's more just the model of, of collaboration. Yeah, I could see that. I can definitely see that. And I saw like, I, 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 I get, I get what you mean, but it, it doesn't have to be classical music. Like, like like the the genre evolves and and i think i think common throughout what all all of you guys have said is like there's is the intention to serve like it's 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 about it's about you can you could you could serve the joy of the audience you could you could just say it's entertainment or it could be something like like bridging the gap finding finding the the connections um between people who seem to be divided so yeah i think i think that's probably that must be essential to to building a community around you like there there must be like an intention around it um whether it is whether it is like dividing dividing or uh, bridging uh, a country that seems to be divided, or or simply the appreciation of of the craft. Um, there needs to be like a clear something that's that's being served, or something that's being devoted to. Um, yeah, I feel like that 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 must be at the core of of uh, a community's sustainability. Um, Besides that, what do you guys think is, do any of you guys have a, a, a sense of some of the, the essential ingredients of a community that, that can build and sustain itself? Because we just got on the, the, like the common passion, but is there, is there something else? Is there something else that's important that, that, that needs to be named? I mean, it's, it's interesting because um, it sounds to me like we're all interacting with communities that are quite disparate in a way. Like when we're talking about building community online, especially during the pandemic, I mean, we're building community with people around the globe or like Mickey, I'm curious about when you go from like one state to another, you're going, you're like, you're reaching all these people that are across this huge geographical space and like building and ma maintaining community is so interesting in that way when like you're maybe not based in one location. Like in, in some ways, if you have a home base or a, or a specific community that you're constantly serving, you can you can always build that. I find it's a little bit trickier to kind of navigate community building when you're a touring musician or you're or you're mostly online. Um, I think maybe one thought for that is is again going back to that intention or that set of values or mission that people can always connect with. So like they know that the Tetrio is this or they know that the Talia Quartet is this, and you can exist in these disparate spaces, but still know that your community is kind of grounded in that, in that mission. Um, even if you only see that community in person once every three years, like, I, I don't know the next time, it's funny, we were just in Utah as well. And I like, I don't know the next time I'll be in Utah, but I hope that I can continue to nurture that community from afar. I don't know. Um, yeah, it kind of depends how you define community, I guess, um, and like in terms of sustainability, also for like financial sustainability, I have like very, probably like three different tiers of 
community around Gather Here. Like they're the people that I actually see in person to collaborate with, to put on concerts and the people I play for. And then there are people on social media who follow me. Like I don't have a very big following, but I have picked up a lot of people who I've never met and who have never been to Gather Here concert, but they're like so into the content. And that's really cool. And they like actually give money when I do fundraisers. Um, and then, and then there are of course like people I actually know who I don't play for through Gather Here, but they also follow the project and they feel part of the project by you know giving money. I don't know what the other level is. <laughs> I have like bigger donors who don't necessarily like they're not on social media, but they enjoy when I write to them and tell them about the project and they're still still part of that orbit. And that's kind of interesting because a lot of times they're like rich white people who are people that I'm like pretty explicitly not targeting in Gather Here concerts. Like I don't want to play for rich white people. Um, so it's like interesting that they're also part of the orbit and they're passionate about the project. Um, so yeah, especially this day and age with the internet, it's, it's interesting to me how you can build community on very different levels. And I think we can definitely like harness that to make our projects more sustainable. I think for Te Chiu, um talking about different levels of community, we tend to have a lot of um, students, much younger, much younger um, people who, who are interested in what we're doing. So they could be just secondary school or high school students, right? That they are just regular brass or even win woodwind players in the in their high school band, secondary school band. And what we do, we just hope that it gives some of them a green light that like, you know, you can do something like this too. Like we're not just, you know, boring tacit classical brass musicians that in in a nutshell we're trying to make the brass instrument cool again so that there'll be more people in the future who follow as close as possible in the footsteps that we're taking now because um i think that's how community is, is uh, sustains itself by allowing following generations to feel like they can do the same thing or give them the energy to want to do the same thing yeah that's how i see it if you're talking about sustaining a community for brass because the music world in singapore is not big i mean the population in singapore is not big anyway so um we take what we get and future generations of of brass players um yeah we, we just hope that it grows eventually Yeah, the, the point about, and, and this, this makes inspiration, the, the inspiration as a, as, a, as a mission so much more important because like, I, I feel like a lot of times you can be flippant about, about saying inspiration is part of your mission, but, but like what you're talking about, Alex, is like, it, it's, it, it's important. Like, it's in, like to get a, a kid excited about the brass instrument like to see that it can be fun or um to see that you're clearly having fun because you guys clearly have a lot of fun <laughs> sorry christina was it your nephew oh yeah, yeah a student student yeah 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 seeing seeing a, a video of a, of a kid watching your video and just like cracking up like that's that's so that's there, like, there's not much else. Like, that's so. That's just like the pure, huh? That's the goal. Yeah. 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 Exactly. That's just like that's fulfillment right there. Like, that's that's so so wholesome and it's so like real and it's it's yeah. It feeds the next generation. Um, and and yes, that is that is uh, also the the angle of sustainability. I was I was 
meaning to to communicate which was like how 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 do you keep your community going like how do you keep your your community not just coming together for your show but also like like continuing to engage with each other or continuing to to um be there for you when you come back and still be at, at the same same level and get of engagement with you um yeah that's that's something i'm curious about um and and the layers are really interesting too which isn't something that i thought of um so mickey with you having like your in person and then the people who are on your social media and then your your investors um <laughs> Yeah, like having all these tears, I, that's not something that I thought about, but it makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, Chris, do you have, do you, do you feel like you have distinct layers of, of community as well with the Talia Quartet? Um, yeah, I think that sounds, it sounds pretty familiar. And, and it's interesting to think about, um, you know, that, blurry space of of the community that supports us and the community that we serve and like how those kind of weave in with each other because there are those people who we hope give will give us money and that we will give them something in return for that but like those relationships are sometimes more motivated by financial need than necessarily serving them partly because as mickey said they're often rich white men who are not necessarily our audience priority um but yeah i think we definitely have those levels and and there's also um you know relationships are are everything in our industry in our field and so um again finding finding those relationships that are really val not not valuable financially but just but really are are natural and 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 engaging um uh, a mentor of, of ours um he's a member of the Miro quartet he um did a bunch of research back into his into his life and he's been in string quartet since he was in he was 18 years old and he's played for like maybe 500 presenters or something um and he did the math and and discovered that only i think nine percent of those presenters actually built his career so of all of those presenters there were only a handful of relationships that really built a sustainable career for him as a chamber musician. So that's more the community on the kind of support side of things. But to me, it really demonstrated um, there is obviously something to be said about having, you know, 6 million Instagram fo followers, but there's also something to be said about cultivating relationships and community that's really focused and intentional. Um, and, and I think maybe that's one way that I view these view the layers, because obviously we want to reach as many people as possible and impact as many people as we can. Um, but there's also that that intention and that really focused relationship and community building that I think can not only help sustain an ensemble or a musician, but can also help hone the impact that musician has in specific places, um, kind of laser focus. If I could add yeah. a point to this, um, I think for most of us, when we go through conservatory, we don't, we're not explicitly taught all these things, right? You are mainly trained to play your instrument and how to interpret pieces and uh, how to work with other musicians. That was essentially what I went through up to my master's. So no, there's not a lot of uh, instruction about uh, community engagement. Yes, there is might be a module here and there, but uh, like the, I think all of us really had to put our, our minds into what we really want to do. And serving community can, for me, I see it as two ways. First is if you created like a, uh, it could be creating a community for, for the performing musicians, right? Let's say for volunteer groups, right? You, you would want to get a bunch of people so that they all have this experience like as a hobby so that everyone can perform. But then um, you can also have the other side where you, you uh, want to build up, uh, like for example, like to use today as an example, we want to, to make brass instruments more 
mainstream and more accessible. So I think if people gave more thought about uh, what they are really trying to do, then um, with with clearer directions, it usually means the 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 um, group is more sustainable. The idea is more sustainable. So I think this is something that people can put more thought into. Yeah. Yeah, the queer intention thing is very important. Yeah. Yeah, that I mean that's yeah, that's that's essential. Um yeah, let me um I think I'd like to go a little bit deeper into and Jasper, I know you have to go in a little bit, so feel free to 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 uh check out when you need to. Um <clears throat> But um, I'm really curious about any stories you guys have about um, moments when you felt your music connecting people. Um, in, in ways that surprised you. Yeah, I'll leave the question at that. Like, if anything comes up for you guys. Um, yeah, so this year for my Massachusetts tour, I did all my concerts outside because of COVID, mm. um, which I don't usually like to do because like part of my mission is to go into these community gathering spaces that people like to hang out in and they're usually like cool quirky places that you know that are just cool to play in so I don't really like being outside but um I had to for COVID and so I was often in these public squares around Massachusetts like around Boston and um they were in pretty diverse cities, um, considering Massachusetts is not that diverse, but there are there are certain cities that are that have you know like a lot of immigrants and stuff like that. And um, just people walking by, like the way that they react to classical music, like I might be playing something super serious, like I was playing Liszt Sonata, and you know, like you might think that people will just walk past and just like maybe look and then go off on their own thing. But like people really stop and they really, they really listen. Like you, you can sense that they're really listening. Um, and I thought that it was kind of incredible that like maybe these people would have thought if they heard that there was a classical music concert, maybe they wouldn't have gone. But to like stumble upon it and to like to just face the music, face value, and then be moved enough to like stay and listen to the whole thing. Um, that just really spoke to the power of classical music to me that like maybe I didn't really realize before. Cause it's a little different from like playing inside a space where people come because they know I'm coming and they wanna come. This kind of like chance encounter really kind of proved what kind of power classical music can have. So that was really interesting for me. Yeah, that is interesting. Like th there's something there's something powerful about the like the environment contrast um of just like putting the classical music outside of the more exclusive or or kind of polished stage and just having it be something that you stumble upon there's something like i'm getting a sense of like it, it feels a little bit more mystical or uh, it's kind of weird it's like it, 
it turns into this weird performance piece because like there are cars driving past blasting hip hop <laughs> right in this like hispanic neighborhood and there are like sirens going off because there's like a lot of crime in the city and right. there's just all these things <laughs> happening yeah. and and you talk to people and they're like oh yeah but like that's just what our city's like yeah. and that's kind of incredible that like that's exactly what the city is like and you're putting classical music on top of it yeah. which is really weird <laughs> <laughs> so i i find that like really interesting from like an avant-garde performance like concept <laughs> piece kind of standpoint but <laughs> yeah, a little bit performance art yeah yeah okay all right, all right. see you jesper sorry guys i have to sign off now yeah but thanks thanks for the chat hey that's great having you